Good afternoon. I will take you back from the Grand Service to the Grand Command um, at Versailles. Before that, I would like to thank Mark and Robert, uh, Lucinda and Alex and everybody at Sydney U, ANU and the National Gallery for hosting this conference, for bringing all of us together. Many of us are friends um, who don't see each other so much anymore. And so it's a particular um, thrill and, and pleasure and honor to be here. Thank you both. The influence of the Petit Academy on visual art and the employment of artifacts to express royal propaganda expanded beyond the weaving of Gobelin tapestries and the printing of text and images describing these textiles. And I start there because I very much um, spend years uh, thinking about those. I um, want to speak a little bit more about the external side of the Gobelin and, in fact, the collaboration with artists at the Louvre. At the Chateau de Versailles, multiple decorative schemes in and outside the palace show the political motivation and the programs of the academicians executed by an extensive group of royal artisans working for the propaganda charge representative needs of the Sun King. Within the context of royal manufacture, the production of architectural elements in sculpture outside, in stucco work, and painted and veneered paneling inside the king's residence, and indeed the major task of coordinating and completing both home and gardens, presents an episode that sheds light not only on the practical methods of employing artisans du roi in situ, but also on their constant demand and ever-changing tasks that were requested of these multi-talented artists. This paper is concerned with the collaboration of royal sculptors who often belonged either to the workshops of the Manufacture Royale de Gobelin or the Louvre and who were employed for their individual reputation and the services they rendered at the Académie de Peinture et de Sculpture. My focus is on the first Pater d'eau, an advertedly a public space at Versailles, and the participation of the Petit Academy and artists involved in its making. Whereas Germain Martin stated, and I quote, Dans les manufactures royales, il, meaning the royal artisans, sans loger et nourrir, et ne peuvent sortir de l'enceinte de l'établissement qu'à des heures fixées. It is indeed imperative to this, the discussion of the artisan du roi to acknowledge that collaboration among the artists from the Louvre workshops and the Gobelin manufactory undoubtedly well characterizes um, royal manufacture um, on, on the whole. Strong links between the different individual workshops at the Louvre and the Gobelin developed as they supplied the crown. The movement between workshops and royal building sites and the joint ventures accomplished are exemplified by the work and work patterns of painters, sculptors, and carpenters from both artist colonies who collaborated at various Chateau Royal. The account books of the Batiment Roy de, du Roi list various different payments to workers at, for example, Versailles and Mali, suggesting that either the involvement of the best suited specialists for each individual job was demanded, no matter whether they originated from the Louvre or Gobelin, or that such a large number of artists was needed for the timely completion of the large building projects initiated by Louis XIV and organized and supervised by Jean-Baptiste Colbert, that members were drawn from both institutions. The lively correspondence of Colbert and the King indicates that both men took great interest in the ongoing construction work at Versailles, but it omits any indication of their creative input. Colbert's position as surintendant bound him to oversee the workers and to push for progress and completion. In his reports, he writes in great detail of the sections completed and partial successes achieved and names further projects ahead. Colbert himself signed contracts with workers, such as Claudigny, who was employed to install the hydraulics for the fountains in the park at Versailles. And it's particularly nice to see some of the, the metal work in the exhibition here. Um, and at least in retrospect, 
Colbert can be seen as commissioner of the statues in an account drawn in 1692 that lists him, not the king um, or any individual um, other member of the court um, as the commissioner of the, of the parterre. For the king, on the other hand, it would be highly speculative to assume that he, when writing to Colbert from the seat of war in the Netherlands, would have had his say in artistic matters. In order to understand the artist's mobility and its importance to locate, it is important to locate their home and to define whether they were primarily working at the Louvre or the Gobelin workshops and to acknowledge their membership of the Académie de Peinture des Sculptures. Among the academicians, Adam Franz van der Meulen, François Bonmer, Sébastien Leclerc, Baudouin Ivoire, René Antoine Was, François Jouvenet, Pierre Mignard, Claude Guial, Jean Baptiste Conneil, Jean Baptiste Monnier, Gilbert de Sèvres, and François Verdier were, sculptor, were painters and sculptors. Antoine Coiseau, Jean Baptiste Tuby, Jacques Prou, and the engraver Girard Edeling all worked at the Gobelin. At the same time, the painters Charles Hérard, Israel Silvestre, and Anna Scho Hannah showed us some of their um, premises this morning, as well as Jean Lemoine, Noël Coipel, and the sculptors Etienne Leongre, um, François Girardin, Jacques Giratin, and, and his sons, Pierre, a sculptor, Vincent Giratin, a painter, and the engraver, Etienne Baudet, also all members of the Academy, had workshops and accommodation at the Louvre. From the early 1660s, many of these artists participated in creating the extensive and stylistically influential decorative schemes at the Louvre and at Versailles, as we heard before, that underwent serious renovations and extensions following the establishment of Louis XIV as absolute monarch in 1661. Here, the Academy's panegyric theme of the quatre éléments that I previously described uh, with regards to the tapestries, was executed in three-dimensional sculpture for the gardens of Versailles, where, under the supervision of Charles Lebrun, a group of highly skilled sculptors produced three different versions of statues representing the elements. The scholarly discussion around the Grand Parterre at Versailles and attributions of larger changes to its original layout center on the individual influence of the most illustrious artists involved in the arch architectural scheme of the gardens and the interior of, this, of the chateau. These were Louis Leveau, André Lenotre, Charles Lebrun, and Jules Adormazin. An analysis of the second version of the parterre under Louis XIV, the first parterre d'eau, constructed between 1672 and 74, and it only lasted, it was never really completed, and only lasted for about a decade. This discussion very much focuses on Lebrun, as it rules out the participation of Mazin, who reached fame only after the death of Colbert in 83, and suggests that Lenotre his involvement um, cannot be claimed with certainty. Although the architect's dominance, this is Le Nôtre, upon the development of the gardens at Versailles has always been taken for granted, no surviving arch archival documents connect his name to the construction of the Pater d'eau. Moreover, with regards to this project, the account books of the Batiment do not list a single payment in his favor. His influence upon the creation of French formal gardens in general, however, cannot be denied, and his influence in redesigning the park for which he was employed and acted as general supervisor is certain. With regards to the water basins, Lebrun's artistic authority stands out in his influence, especially also upon the sculpture program and his collaboration with fellow artisan Diroy is central to this examination. Within the large collection of drawings left by the painter after his death and confiscated by, from his widow by Levois, who saw these as property of the Batiment du Roi, which in itself um, may suggest uh, teamwork, of course, survive two drawings related to the ground plan of the Pater, as well as Lebrun's overall direction of an interest in the basins, not only as a space for the display of his sculptures. 
In her extensive study of the early panegyric program, Anne Friedman is given the authorship of the Pater to Lebrun, without, however, examining sufficiently the influence of the Petite Academie. The naming of a single author indirectly suggests the control and supervision of a planning authority that, as with the production of the elements in textile and print, relied on choosing specialists within the community of royal artists to contribute to a project that was executed in collaboration. Furthermore, the thematic program itself and the complexity of its allegoric theme suggest the authorship of the literary scholars of the Petite Academy who, as for the weaving of the tapestries and the painting of interior spaces, turned to Lebrun. The director of both the Royal Academy and the Gobelin Manufactory to address the community of royal artisans and academicians, in this case its sculptures, for the execution. Whereas Colbert acted as inspector of buildings and mediator between the crown and its servants, Lebrun organized all artistic collaboration. The choice of sculptors such as François Girardin, Jean-Baptiste Duby, and Martin Desjardins indicates that due to the enormous size of the project, most of the members of the Academy were, com were commissioned to contribute as Lebrun favored them for their artistic skill and acknowledged their personal status by having them work on projects as central to both the extension of Versailles and the propaganda concerns of the King's Grand Command. In lieu of the lost records of the Petite Academy's existence prior to 1696, the year of its reestablishment and consequent treatment as an independent institution, its Reglement of 1701 clearly states the academician's task to develop and spread propaganda by means of visual display. As with the letters patent upon which the organization of the Manufacture de Gobelin and the workshops at the Louvre were based, the statutes of the Academy describe, in retrospect, its professional scope as much as ongoing and already completed projects. Since the Petite Academy's involvement had been initiated by Colbert in 1663, this retrospective covered 38 years, of which, according to the number of monuments built and texts published, the first 20 years under Colbert were the most significant. Surviving correspondence of several academicians with the Surintendants discuss projects they were involved with. The secondary literature on the quarrel over the planning of the Pater counts many paragraphs devoted to the importance of Lebrun as the sole genius responsible for the initial designs of the sculptures commissioned for the Grand Commande, and whether, therefore, all pieces executed show a perfect unity of style, the Lebrun style. As the original preliminary drawings for the statues have been preserved and the sculptures themselves survive, they can be compared and similarities with the original designs can be found and models attributed. Artemis Cledis has done so and highlights the painter's inspirational dependence on Cesare Ripa's Iconologia, but she doesn't explain the reasons for his choice. Ripa's text was widely spread and highly influential. With Jean Boudin's translation and reprint of 1644, it became accessible to French scholars and French artists, popularizing allegory at a time when Lebrun himself completed his education by producing copies after the allegoric paintings by Raphael and antique statuary in Rome. Le Lebrun produced the overall design for the Pater d'eau and suggestions for single sculptures therein. Reaper's iconologia influenced the design of the iconographic scheme and artistic execution. As some of the figures after existing drawings attributed to Lebrun seem to show the personal style of their sculptors, the lack of perfect unity can be explained as a merit of collaborating with highly skilled artists that were known for their own artistic characteristics. Also, the surviving drawings show different stages of completion and, if at all, seem not always to represent the final design. And, of course, Benedict referred to that a lot today. 
in this case the final designs for the sculptures to work from, but might also include earlier ideas for designs that were refined at a later stage. This refinement might include the work of the executing sculptor who by transferring two-dimensional designs to three-dimensional sculptures would have had the liberty to correct and modify. On one occasion, Lebrun exclusively addressed his colleagues from the Royal Manufactory as a team when he asked Guillaume Manguer, Dominique Cucci, Philippe Caffieri and Jean-Baptiste Tuby for a model of the Pater d'eau, a commission that suggests a fast in-house production rather than after the director's design. This three-dimensional model, it doesn't exist anymore, guided the initial construction and might have indicated the exact positioning of individual sculptures, of which several pieces had not been completed by the time the parterre was remodeled a third time from 1683 onwards. Friedman refers to a payment of 800 livres for, from the Comte du Roi to a sculptor, Georges Sibrak, active in Versailles between 72 and, 70, and 82 for a second model and argues that it offered an alternative design for the king to choose from. However, it seems more plausible that Sibrak, who was largely employed for basic preparatory and building work before he began his statue of L'Afrique, one of the, the sculptures for the Grand Commande, never supplied a model, but was indeed paid for physically remodeling the original parterre and for digging the cavity for the large water basin. If so, he was defined to work from the model produced by the Gobelin sculptors after Lebrun and to transfer the dimensions and layout from drawn designs and a small scale model in order to reshape the full scale parterre. The large sum paid to him from the royal account justifies such suggestion. It is noteworthy that the final design presented a highly developed space that because of its extensive sculpture program resembled a theatrical stage or a cour versaillaise rather than a garden. Ellen Weiss commented on the development of the formal garden in 17th century France saying that it was constructed against nature and that, I, I quote, the use of the garden as a social, political and theatrical setting only exaggerated the, ant the anti-naturalist sentiments in this regard. Nature was transformed into sign, symbol and stage, end of quote. This phenomenon was well understood at the time. Contemporary texts described this new form of landscape architecture show little interest in nature itself and to omit all mention of the little that was left. What could be described as ignorance only further indicates the subordination of the elements and human mastery to the shape of nature. The Park of Versailles in its iconographic program clearly aimed to glorify Louis XIV by celebrating his political strength, his power over nature, the park, animals, the menagerie, and the domestic, like the pater d'eau and exotic world, the Trianon de Porcelaine. The pater displayed representations of the elements, the times of the day and the seasons, positioned around the central marble globe, which, all taken together, were symptomatic of a universe that, if seen from a higher position at the chateau, lay to the feet of Louis XIV. Like the imagery of the tapestries and the multiple descriptions in the Mercure Galon, the Sun King's dominance was expressed here in a very different medium, extending the multifaceted propaganda of the Bourbon reign. The accessibility of the gardens at Versailles and regular receptions at the chateau guaranteed public knowledge of the parterre sculpture and led to the dissemination of numerous texts describing the allegorical theme, most notably the king's own Manière de montrer le Jardin de Versailles of 1689, whereas the complex tapestries of the elements and seasons were accompanied by detailed explanation 
and engravings popularizing the king's glory, the Petit Academy published this monograph of the gar on the gardens and its sculptures in the name of Louis XIV, and as a personal statement, an invitation to view the panegyric theme, as well as the engineered marvels, such as the hydraulic pumps feeding water into the fountains and the insulated caves of the ice houses. In addition to this guidebook, and in fact prior to its publication, the academician supervised the reporting of several private visits to the chateau and its gardens by Madame de Scudry, La Fontaine, and Philippien that provided the interested public with first-hand observations promoting the plus grand beauté of the new residential palace. However, unlike the Manière de Montrer that led visitors on a political parcours, none of the three descriptive tales draw parallels to the political events of the time, as noted by Stefan Germer, as part of his analysis of Philippien's Description du Chateau. This multiplication of angles from which the gardens and the chateau were approached, both physically and literary, exemplifies the multifaceted thinking behind the propaganda of the Petite Académie. The landscaping of the gardens took place in parallel to the Mercure Galant's weekly reporting on the king's political and military accomplishments, episodes that were produced in tapestry and woven to commemorate the Histoire du Roi. The form of glorification found in the parterre is detached from the latest history and expresses Louis's superiority in a way that reminds of the Petite Academy's production of the elements and seasons and foreshadows also later programs, notably the Histoire Metallique, which concentrate on preserving an image of universal dominance. The original Paterdo was destroyed shortly after Colbert's death in 1683, testifying to both the short-lived nature of substantial and highly expensive building projects and the propaganda value connected to it, as well as to the, addition, the individual power of personal interest in succeeding, of succeeding superintendents. Whereas the blocked access to the lower and larger parts of the gardens were brought forward as a reason for the destruction of the water basins, the changes applied to the first floor of the palace that were described before and the consequent loss of the terrace from where the parterre d'eau and its iconographic scene uh, was easiest seen and most enjoyed constitute a second argument, constituted a second argument for the rebuilding of the basin. In parallel, Levaux was extending the existing chateau by building an envelope and, therefore, and thereby changing at ground plan in association with the surrounding gardens. The construction and decoration of the new Galerie de Glace, which occupied the transmittal space of the terrace, changed the, perspec the, the, perspec the, sorry, the perception of the outside inside and concentrated the focus within the new gallery. Instead of functioning as an intermediate bridging the out and inside, the gallery offered a semi-public space for the reception of guests and representations of art, taste, and tradition, keeping all focused attention inside the building. Before the construction of the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles, the, de the decoration of the Galerie d'Apollon at the Louvre had marked both the unparalleled ambition to present the power and influence of the young king and the artistic collaboration of numerously highly reputed royal painters and sculptors to create a display of political propaganda. Distant from the progressively charged attention and publicized interest in the king's gardens and galleries, the execution of the royal family's private apartments received no lesser care. The highly artistic work completed at Versailles during the second half of the 17th century is indicative of the productive collaboration of the Artisan du Roi from the Louvre as it had been at Vaux and Mancy, from where many of the first generation Gobelin artists originated, the Louvre and the Académie Royale de Peinture et de Sculpture. Artists freed from the guilt restrictions 
worked flexibly both with regards to their professional specializations, here at Versailles sculptors worked in wood, stone and bronze, and their geographical employment as they worked in individual royal workshops as well as united as one equipe under the guidance of Lebrun and the Petit Academy. Thank you.